If you have your Bibles, turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to start reading in verse 13, chapter 3. It says, But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and teaching, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Let's pray. Jesus, we come before you this morning as we read this scripture, read this passage at Paul's encouragement to Timothy, Lord, we pray that you would speak to us through your word this morning as he exhorted him to preach the word and to, to continue in the word, continue in the things that he's learned. We pray, Lord, that you would teach us this morning how we can apply this to our lives and our responsibility to this, Lord, our, our role in the kingdom of God and, and preaching the word and getting the gospel out and the sharing with others the hope that we have. Lord, may, we, may you pour out your spirit on us this morning and teach us and inspire us and, um, and, and empower us, Lord, to, to continue the work of the ministry. So we love you, Lord, and we just ask that you would bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I wanted to read uh, that section. We're, we're going to pick out some different, um, uh, different parts of, of the, the, the entire passage that we read, but I wanted to read it so that you have some content of, context of what Paul is telling Timothy. Now, this is a letter that Paul wrote to to Timothy, uh, widely agreed that this is probably the last letter that Paul wrote to the church. It's uh, be the letter that uh, he would express um, to Timothy some of uh, the most or more important things doing, uh, considering the word of God or considering ministry. He knows that his time is short, that he probably uh, won't make it very much longer. So he uses some very strong exhortations, some very direct challenges um, to, to tell Timothy to say, hey, man, you, you got to continue the ministry. You got to teach people. You got to equip the people. Continue in the word. Preach the word. He, he very, very much of a, uh, a letter of exhortation. You know, we think about like when we read Philippians, you're, you know, it's, it's all about rejoicing and love and, and, and this great relationship that they have with Philippians. And this letter is, it, to Timothy is more so, hey, that you've learned these things. Go do them. You know, continue on. My time is short. My, I've run my race. I've, I've fought the good fight. I've, I've done the things that God's told me to do. My time has come to an end. Now, Timothy, it's, it's on you to continue that. And that's kind of the, the encouragement that he gives throughout the whole letter. And in chapters 3 and 4 in particular, he gives this really strong exhortation for the Word of God, to not leave the Word of God, to continue in the Word of God, uh, in, instructing him to say, you know, preach the Word of God. Preach the word. And so as we, as we read the passage that we're in, we can read this. And, and he uses some things. He says some things here to, to remind Timothy or, or to at least warn him or let him know that uh, there are those that are going to come who are evil. And they're imposters. And they're going to grow worse and worse. He'll say that in verse 13. He'll say uh, in verse 3 of chapter 4, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears. They'll heap for themselves teachers. That, that Paul's warning Timothy that in a day, or there's going to come a day where people aren't going to be interested in the Word of God. They're going to they're gonna, they're gonna stray away from God's Word. They're going to deny the truth. They're not going to want to hear the truth. They're gonna, people are, you're going to go, and you're going to go into villages and cities and towns and, and co, you know, have coworkers and neighbors, and you're going to preach the gospel, and they're going to reject it. 
And they're going to say, what you're saying is foolish, or it's, it's, it doesn't apply anymore. That's an old-time religion. Or there will be things like that. Paul's telling Timothy in his day, in the first century, that would happen. And as we read this, you think, well, I think Paul was talking about my day. Because <laughs> I kind of live in a day like that, right? Where people are rejecting the truth. People don't want to hear the truth. People uh, are, are going away from the Word of God. And, and I would even say uh, in the church and outside of the church that the Word of God isn't emphasized, that the power of the Word of God is maybe dumbed down or, or, or uh, watered down, we would say, to say, you know what, let's that's, that's, that's not tell someone that, that if they don't accept Jesus, they, they'll go to hell. Let's not say that. Let's that's, that's, that's just tell them that, you know, uh, that, you know, let's not use the word hell, or let's not use the word sinner. Don't call someone a sinner or something like that. There's, there's this great danger and this fight to water down the word of God, to, to try to appease the itching ears or to appeal to the, to the culture, to the society. And so we live in a culture like that where very much that's part of our society. That's, that's not talk about reality. That's not talk about the truth. Well, Paul had this even in the first century, I mean, I think of, of the time we live in, and this is certainly true, that time is now, but Paul also had this um, in, in, in the first century, and so he tells Timothy, he reminds them to continue in the things that you've learned. Now, remember, Timothy was a disciple of Paul. He was someone who traveled with Paul. He was on one of the missionary trips. Uh, he endured a lot of suffering with Paul, a lot of great things that happened, a lot of victories, churches started. Uh, Timothy was somebody that Paul entrusted uh, to continue on in different uh, parts of, of their missionary trip. He left them in Ephesus to, to be a pastor, to teach the people. Uh, he sends them to the, uh, the Philippians to say, man, I'm sending you Timothy because there's no one else that I have that's more like-minded that will take care for your, uh, of your needs. And so Paul and Timothy's relationship is very, very close. He trusted Timothy. He calls him a dear son in the faith. Um, and so Paul is reminding him, saying, look, Timothy, you know, these things are going to happen. You're going to go preach the word of God. You're going to share. You're going to teach the word, and people aren't going to really be open to that. But you must continue in the things which you've learned. Paul or Timothy learned a certain philosophy of ministry. He learned a certain way to go into a city and to preach the gospel, to share Jesus with people. He learned, he watched Paul, and he modeled Paul in, that, in, in the demonstration of, of, of um, you know, obviously the, the working of the Holy Spirit, the open doors of the Holy Spirit, but uh, he dem Paul demonstrated to Timothy what it was to preach the gospel or to share Jesus. And so he says, remember those things, continue in that. And then he even reminds him from a childhood in verse 15 of chapter 3 that from his childhood he knew the scriptures. His mom and his grandmother would teach him the Bible, would read the Bible to him. Read Now, maybe not a Bible like you and I have in our hands where, you know, it's all nicely formatted verses and chapters. And, and you know, uh, like if, if we had the scroll and I, we'd read the verses that I just read, I mean, it would take us probably three hours just to find verse 13. <laughs> you know, uh, you start right in the middle there. Um, but, you know, he had the Old Testament. His, his mother and his grandmother, some point in their lives, maybe grew up uh, with the word of God, with the Old Testament, and would read Timothy those things and, and teach him those things. And so Timothy had a great understanding, um, at least of the, of, of the Old Testament, of the, of the scriptures. And so Paul says, continue in those things. They've given you wisdom. And then he says that all scripture is given by inspiration. We're going we're gonna to go back to that because that's an important point uh, that he makes here. But, but just that reminder, look, the scripture... You know that, that you've learned these things from your from your from your youth. Uh, continue in them. Don't leave them. Preach the word. You know this. this the convict. He says convict, con instruct, rebuke. Uh, these these instructions that he has because because he knows that Timothy's going to be in, living in a day and is living in a day where people aren't interested in the truth. And so, uh, if you want to turn with me in first uh, first Corinthians chapter one, I want to give you an example because. Sometimes I think, I, uh, for me personally, I feel like, well, that's, I live in that day. I go to share the gospel with someone, and they're just not interested. Or, or what do I say? Or what do I do? You know, how, how, can I, how can I reach my culture, my generation? You know, with all the wickedness that's happened, all the evil that's around us, all the influence of, of, of all the technology and, and resources that we have available to us, uh, how do I reach, how do I penetrate a culture, a society with the, with the truth that, in a culture that doesn't want the truth or that says they want the truth, but really they don't? 
Um, you know, we, had a, I have, we have an expression, um, you know, keeping it real. Now, I don't know if you use that expression, I use that. Uh, I grew up in a neighborhood where we said, man, just keep it real. The problem is, is that we live in a culture that says keep it real, but they're not really real. <laughs> We're fake, <laughs> you know. Hey, just keep it real. Oh, okay. Well, so then you, go keep, you try to keep it real, and they're like, oh, no, we don't want that. That's, that's too real for us, or we don't want to go there. And so um, that's the culture we live in, but this is also, this was true in Paul's day. And we want to look at a few things because uh, that phrase that he uses back in, in 2 Timothy, that they have itching ears. Um, you know, I, I don't know, like, my ears don't itch too much. You know, my back itches sometimes, you know. But that, that idea, we know that expression of, of that feeling of being, you know, having that itch in your ear, behind your ear or something in your back. And, and as someone scratches it or you scratch it, just the relief of that, like, oh, yeah, that was great. Awesome. You know, I felt that relief. Well, Paul's using that kind of illustration to say, look, there's, there's those that they, they want to hear something, but they only want to hear what they want to hear. That, that they want to hear something that's going to they're going to make them feel good. They're going to, they want to hear something that's going to make them relieve that, that itch that they have. They have this itch, and it's kind of, kind of making them uncomfortable, and they want somebody to come around and scratch them uh, so that they don't feel uncomfortable anymore, so that they feel, uh, uh, you know, whatever, uh, encouraged or whatever the, the, the word would be. But they want uh, for people to tell them what they want to hear. We, don't, we, want to, we want to hear what we want to hear. And so this was true in Paul's day. If you look at 1 Corinthians, we're going to start in chapter 1, verse 17. It says, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom, uh, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross be, of Christ should be made of no effect. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of, his, of this age? Has not God made foolishness the wisdom of this world? For since, uh, for since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believed. For the Jews request a sign, and the Greeks, they seek after wisdom. So Paul's saying when he went to Corinth, now you have to remember in the first century, you had uh, the, the, the different, you know, Paul's from Israel. You know, he's from kind of, you know, he grew up a Pharisee, grew up in the, in the culture of very much the, the, the uh, you know, the Pharisee culture, learning the word of God, memorizing the word of God. You know, he studied, he's very educated, studied under the, one of the best um, teachers in that day, in that time, in the area. And so Paul is very well acquainted with the word of God, with the Pharisees. You know, he even tells us in other passages that he was the Pharisee of Pharisees. He was advanced among his contemporaries. Like he, 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 was, he was the man. Like he was on the fast track to being the high priest or whatever, you know, or someone, maybe not the high priest, but, uh, but just very um, influential in that, in that world. And so he was very well acquainted with that, but as he got saved and God began to do a work in his life, it was clear that after some time that he was going to become the apostle to the Gentiles, the pastor of the Gentiles, that as he went on these missionary trips and he would go into these different villages and preach the gospel and share Jesus with people, that it wasn't too long um, after the ministry started that he was going to, his main ministry was going to be to this culture, to this society that's completely pagan. That's totally into idol worship and, and, and have the, this, this culture that has many gods. That they would, they would go into the, the Greeks were known for having several different types of gods. Whatever they felt like, you know, that they, whatever lust they had or whatever desires they had or whatever they, they saw that, was, uh, that they liked, they made it a god. So water, ocean, wind, girls, whatever it was, whatever desire that they would come up with, they'd say, hey, we need to have a god for that. <laughs> and so they'd have several different gods. And so, so Paul would go into these, these towns where there was much pagan worship, idolatry, uh, traditions, all these things, and he would come and he would preach Jesus. He, he would preach that there's one God, and that one God loved us so much that he sent his son Jesus in the world to die for our sins, and that through him we can have the forgiveness of sins and the promise of heaven and, and the eternity with God. That was his message to a, to a culture that says, no, there's many gods, he, he would come and say, no, God laid himself, laid his, his life down for us. Now, that would be a culture that says, no, 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 
God would die for you? How, would, how can God, how can, you know, and, and they would have this, this idea that, that, no, your message is foolishness. What you're saying doesn't make any sense. And so Paul lived in a, in a day, in a, in, a, in a time period where people wanted their ears itched. And he says for the Jews, or for, for the Jews, it was a sign. Remember, show us a sign. And they, told, they asked Jesus, show us a sign. And, and, and there was this, this culture for the Jews to say, man, we, we want to see something that we can physically you know, touch or see, and that, then we'll believe. And you, know, you and I know that's true. You hear people say that. Well, I'll believe in God if he shows me a sign. We know that's not true because God shows us signs every single day. You know, I mean, the fact that we're breathing, our lungs are, are working, and, and our hearts are pumping, and our brains are, are working, I mean, that to me is a, is a miracle. The fact that um, I can say any words right now is a miracle, not just because, you know, you're terrified up here. I like this, this pulpit. You guys don't know this, but there, there's, like a, there's like a worn out spot here, I think from, the, from holding this really tight and like rubbing. I always, I always, it always encourages me. It's like, okay, somebody's also nervous when they're up here. Um, but, you know, but they're, 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 they want a sign. Give me a sign. The Greeks wanted wisdom. They wanted some sort of higher learning. That the, your message, that's the simplicity of the gospel, that's foolishness. We need something that's, that's higher, that's more advanced. The Greeks were obviously known for their education, for their, uh, for their advancement in, in you know, speech and, and all these different things, philosophy. Uh, some of the greatest thinkers in the world come from this culture. And so he says that, look, we didn't do any of that. We came, he says, for, the, for, for uh, verse 23, but we preached Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block, to the Greeks, foolishness. But to those who were called, both Jew and Greek, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than man or men. So Paul's saying, look, you guys wanted a, the Jews wanted a sign, the Greeks wanted this philosophy, this philosophical wisdom that, you know, that higher learning that, you know, that no one could understand but a, but a few, that we're the elite, we're the smartest, we're the most educated. And he says, man, we didn't do any of that. We came and we preached Christ crucified. We came and preached the simplicity that's in Christ, the, the simple message of the gospel. You see, Paul did it did it adapt his, his philosophy of ministry or the, 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 the exhortation or the, the burning in his heart to preach the gospel? He didn't adapt those things to what the culture said that they wanted. And I think that's one of the things we have to be careful of is that the, the culture doesn't depict, I mean, doesn't change the word of God. The word of God changes the culture. And I think we have to understand that as, a, as Christians, especially to understand, because, because many of you guys in this room have, have lived long enough to have different shifts in the culture, right? It was one way when you were born. It was, it was a, the, the, the country or the world was a certain way. And as you grew up, it started to change and change and change to where it is now. And so you've adapted and you've been a part of several different types of society or culture experiences or cultural revolutions or whatever you call it. And yet, the one thing that's remained the same is the God's word. So when the culture starts to, starts to say, no, we need to change God's word so that you can, you can scratch our itch, you start to get in trouble. But see, you see, Paul used the word of God to try to change the culture. And that's, that's something that he never went away from. That's something that he always was true to, that he said, man, the Jews want a sign, the Greeks want, want wisdom, but man, we preach Christ and him crucified. He'll continue on in verse 26. It says, for you see your calling, brethren, for not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things that are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things that are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him who are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom of God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that it is written, he who glorifies, let him glory in the Lord. And so Paul telling the church here, look, God is using the foolishness, the foolish things in the world to confound the wise. He's using the foolishness of the gospel. Now that's kind of a weird phrase, right? The foolishness of the gospel. 
But, but what Paul's getting at here is he's not saying that the gospel is silly, that, you know, hey, we'll just believe in some weird fables and some silly bedtime story or something like that. He's not using it in that term, but he's, he's, he's writing to an audience that would, uh, a Greek, Greek audience that would say, man, we want wisdom. We want Aristotle. We want, uh, you know, these, these thinkers. We want the high advanced learning. And here Paul comes in and says, no, well, the, the, there's no secret. There's no higher learning. The gospel, anybody can understand. It. Anybody can learn it. That, that the reality that God came and sent, or he sent Jesus in the world to die for our sins, that by believing in him, your sins are forgiven, you can go to heaven. The Greeks would laugh at that. The Jews would say, well, that's, no, we, we, we're waiting for the Messiah to come and, and, and crush Rome and, 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 and reestablish the kingdom and, and overthrow everything in Israel back to its power and its heyday. That's the sign we're looking for. You see, Every culture, every time in history since the first century, since the beginning of the church, there has been a groups of people that are looking to get their ears scratched. And Paul's saying, look, we weren't interested in that because we understand that God chooses these things. He chooses the foolish. He chooses the, the, the not many mighty, not many noble are called. And we're going we're gonna to look at that again in a second uh, of what that means because he'll continue in chapter 2. In 1 Corinthians, I and I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech. Now remember, this is a Greek culture that would pride themselves in public speaking. That would, that would you know, you're talking to a, a, a culture or, or uh, groups of people that invented public speaking, the way we would public speak today. That you would go to a communications class in college or, or in school, and they would, they would teach you the very principles that these guys came up with to be able to public speak, to be a good public speaker. I obviously did not go to that class, but, but that was that the, that if you studied education or I mean communication, you would learn you they didn't hasn't much changed since since the Greeks and and kind of mastered this or or thought of this. And so he said, I didn't come with you in that excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And then he would say, uh, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, for my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration, very key, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. That's what Paul believed. Paul didn't believe that I need to come in and, and, and persuade you with these, this excellence of speech or this wisdom or try to adapt uh, you know, my, the, who I am, the way God's made me, the, what God's called me to do to try to reach a culture or a society uh, by, with compromising the word of God or re, re compromising the truth. But, but God has called me to come in and to preach the gospel because it's the power of God, to come in and teach the word of God, to share with you God's word because it's powerful. And so Paul understood that. And now one thing I want to kind of make clear is is Paul's, you know, in, in these, this message that he has to them, you know, you have to remember, Paul was very educated. Paul wasn't, you know, some guy who, you know, uh, maybe dropped out of school in third or fourth grade. He was a man who, was, who grew up and very educated, very ambitious, very determined to be, to be something in his life. And so he's not saying that, that, he's not saying, well, I didn't come with you the, the excellence of speech because I couldn't. He said, I determined not to. And this is, this is important for us to understand because, because Paul could have done this. Paul could have been relevant. You know, we use that word. That's kind of a key word for us in our culture, be relevant. You know, he could have done that. He could have come and, 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 and spoke as, though, as the Greeks did. Or he could have come and promoted the signs and wonders for the Jews to, to get people drawn to him and get people to like him and that people would follow him. He could have done those things. But he said, man, I didn't want, I, didn't, I came into your city. I didn't, I didn't want to know what you guys were going through. I just wanted to know, I uh, just wanted to t t tell you about Christ and him crucified. And that's key. So I don't think he's saying, you know, that he's certainly not, you know, he, he himself was educated and, and smart and, and had the ability to do this. But, but that key phrase, that I determined to know nothing among you. That he made a choice that I'm going to stick to the word of God because it's powerful. I'm going to stick to the things that God has shown me, that the, the word of God, because, it's, because that's going to be relevant and that's going to be lasting. And so, so even in the first century, Paul dealing with this in the church of Corinth of battling that, that 
um, that fight of do I become like the, you know he'll even say later in this very this very book you know I become all things to all men to the Greek I became a Greek to the Jew I became a Jew so he's not saying that that you don't um, try to relate to people he's not saying that you don't try to reach a culture that you live in and you, you know he's not saying hey you should do ministry like you did in 1800s and do it now you know there's lots of things in advancement you know I'm sure Hudson Taylor if he knew that we were using the gospel for social media he'd probably be super stoked like oh man you guys are like tweeting bible verses that's awesome i had to get on a boat for like eight months to get to china and, and you know it's like i could have just tweeted from my from my living room how awesome is that you know uh, i i think that there's value and obviously you know you're trying to use use the culture use society to reach a people but what paul's saying is when it came to the word of god the culture did not change my message Society did not change my message. The influence of the world did not change the fact that Jesus came in the world and died for your sins and that you need Jesus. That was a message that he never wavered from. He may, may have gone into the, to the Greek's house and maybe had a couple slices of bacon once in a while or, you know, or, or maybe you know, played some Greek sports or something. I don't know what, what they played, but... Um, you know, he may have adapted to, the, you know, may have, to, in order to reach the people there, may have done some, done some things that maybe he didn't grow up doing or was uncomfortable doing, but his message, when it came to the word of God, never changed. It never wavered because he knew that it was the power of God, the gospel or teaching the word of God. So he, go, and back in our section in, in Timothy, that's what he's instructing Timothy to do. Don't, don't allow or don't let these people who are evil or who are false teachers or who aren't interested in sound doctrine, who are only are according to their own desires or, or have itching ears or will heap for themselves their own teachers, who will turn from aside to fables, don't let those guys influence you to, in preaching the gospel, preaching the word of God. Because the, the, what, he, what he would say here and this is why I wanted to wait on this. In, in verse 16, the scripture that he's talking about, the Bible or the word of God that we're referring to or that we're talking to, there's something about it. He says that all scripture has been given by inspiration of God. Now, when you think of inspiration, there might be, you, know, you may be thinking of someone who's inspired you in your life. Someone maybe has influenced you, like, man, I'm inspired by this person. Or you see something on TV or sports or something, like, man, that's inspiring. Well, this word isn't necessarily like that. This word literally would be, you can translate that all scripture is breathed by God, that God breathed on it. Now, as you're, if, you, if you know the Bible and you think of, well, I've been studying the Bible, I've been a Christian for a while, that kind of sounds familiar in Genesis when, when God made Adam and he made, formed Adam and he, he made him how he was going to make him and how he looked, and, but yet he was just sitting there, I don't know, I guess dead, I don't know how you, what you call it, but no life, and it says that God breathed into Adam and gave him life. You see, the scripture, the word of God, is God's breath giving life into something. You understand that? That, that the, the word of God that we have isn't just words on a ta on, in a page or, or bedtime stories or fables to, to tell your kids so they don't be bad or, or whatever or try to manipulate people or influence someone in a negative way. But the word of God is actually God's words in, inspiring these people to write them down. And it's the Holy Spirit speaking to them. And so, therefore, it's God breathing into this to, to bring life, to bring forth life. That the scripture... There's power to it. It's not just some, someone's ideas or someone's philosophy or, or another textbook, but it's actually God-inspired, God-breathed. And it's profitable. And it's profitable for doctrine. Now, that's that sound doctrine we're talking about, the uh, instruction. It's for reproof, for correction, for instruction to righteousness, that the Word of God does something for you, that the, the Word of God is valuable for you. That if you need instruction, you need help, you need, you need direction, you need to be convicted, you need, uh, you need to be reproofed, or whatever it is, that the Word of God, because it's God's Word, will help you. Now, if you come to me and you say, well, I need some help uh, with this, this, and this, and I, and I give you some lame advice that may not help you or may help you, who knows, but that's, it's only going to be temporary. But if you go to God's Word and God gives you the advice or God gives you direction, well, that's lasting, that's powerful. That's sharper than a two-edged sword. That's something that no one can take away from you. 
That's something that's never going to change. It's timeless that when God speaks to you and he corrects you or reproves you or encourages you or gives you direction or instructions, that's something you can hold on to and it will never fade away. So he's saying, look, Timothy, these things that you've learned, you know them. The, the word of God, is in, the, it's inspired, it's God-breathed, that, that these things that you're learning, the things that you're teaching, they mean something, they're valuable, they're important. He says that the man of God may complete through every equipped, or be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So it also equips you. And that's kind of the point I want to make, uh, uh, this, my second point, or the, the, one of the points this morning, of the word of God equipping you. Because if we know this, if the encouragement for, for Paul and Timothy is to preach the word, share the word, teach the word, and, and he, he tells the Corinthians that I didn't come to determine you, to do nothing of you but to preach the gospel. Uh, I didn't appeal to the Jews. I didn't appeal to the, to the Greeks. I just came and speech, uh, preached the simplicity that's in Christ. How are we equipped to do that? Well, it's the word of God, right? It's the simplicity that's in Jesus. And when, he, when Paul says in Corinthians that not many noble, not many mighty, not many strong, that, that he's saying that, look, any one of us are equipped to preach the gospel. Any one of us are equipped to teach, to teach the word. Now, there's different gifts, obviously. Some of us have the gift of teaching, the gift of evangelism. There's these different gifts, but there's this ability, there's this encouragement or exhortation to say, listen, the man of God, the woman of God can be complete and thoroughly equipped by what? By the word of God. And important, the importance for us as Christians to, to be in the word of God. That when you, you, you're living in a culture, you're living in an environment that's, that's hopeless, that's wicked, that so many bad and terrible things are happening all around us all the time. And, and maybe we're just more aware of it now because of media, social media, and, and the, the, the direct access we have now. I used to have to wait till the next morning to get a newspaper. Like, remember the re- newspapers? You had to open them up. My neighbor still gets a newspaper. I actually make, made fun of him the other day. I was like, oh, what's that on your, on your porch? And he kind of laughed because he's about 15, 20 years older than me. And I was like, oh, that's, what is that? Is that paper? What is that? Um, but, you know, you'd have to, you, you know, you maybe you hear something in the local news or something, but you wouldn't find out till 6 or 7 o'clock in the local news, and then you would read about it maybe in more in depth in the newspaper the next day. Now, uh, instantly... Right? I mean, you get on any, any sort of Google search or media outlet or something, you can find the whole story, minute by minute, details, live coverage, updates, notifications. You know, like, um, I mean, when Billy Graham passed away on Wednesday, I knew before I even woke up in the morning. I woke up, like, I kind of was awake. I, I thought I maybe, you know, was kind of waking up, and my phone was kind of bright or something. I, I kind of look over, and I see, oh, Billy Graham passed away. I went back to sleep. You know, I was like... It's like I, I didn't even like I, I didn't have to learn that through through the news or the newspaper. I mean, my, my phone told me, and it happened. I think he I mean passed away somewhere like four fifteen in the morning. I had a notification at five o'clock, like forty five minutes. Like how many of his family members didn't even know yet? <laughs> you know, like I knew before maybe his, his third or fourth cousin or something. You know, that's the the world we live in, right? Where everything is 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 right there. And so we live in that culture, we live in that environment. How do we, how do we equip ourselves to reach that culture, to reach this generation? It's the Word of God. Equipping ourselves with the Word of God, getting into the Word of God, reading the Word of God, meditating on the Word of God, memorizing the Scriptures, because it's our responsibility to preach the gospel, to preach the Word. We live in a, in a, in a culture where where. It's godless, and people aren't interested in the truth, and we have the truth. And we can tell people that there's a hope. We can tell people that there's forgiveness of sins. We can tell people that there's someone who loves them unconditionally. We can tell someone that, man, there's someone who, who knows the hairs on their head, who, who has so much love and compassion and mercy and grace for them, that if they would just give their life to Jesus, man, that their sins could be forgiven, and they could have the hope of heaven and the, the forgiveness of sins. We have that message to a world that's dying and that is, that is longing for some, some, some fresh water that's, that's, that's deserted in a dry land, and we can give them a cup that Jesus said, if you drink of this cup, you'll never thirst again. That's the message we have. It's not a message that's going to pat someone on the back and say, oh, hey, do this program for 30 days and you'll be okay. Well, you may be okay for 30 days, but what about 31st day, you know? What about, what about day 50, you know, day 60? I need something that when I take a sip of it and I drink it, I'm satisfied forever. 
I need to partake of the bread of life that when I eat it, man, I'm never hungry again. You see, that's, that's, what, that's what the Word of God is. That's who Jesus is. That when we give people the Word of God, we give, point people to Jesus, that's what we're giving them. Something that's everlasting, someone that's powerful and, and, and wonderful. So he says in verse 1 of chapter 4, therefore, preach it. Preach the, or he says, therefore, God um, and, and the Lord Jesus Christ will judge the living and the dead. Verse 2, preach the word. Now, then he says this phrase, in season and out of season. Now, I don't really like that phrase because I kind of want to preach the word when I want to, when I want to preach it. I kind of want to tell someone about Jesus when I want to do it. Kind of like, you know, when I'm determined, uh, you know, I, I, the best example in my own mind, this is more convicting for me personally, is, uh, you know, when you go on a missionary trip. I was thinking of Rich being, being on that trip, and, and, uh, and I'll confess, when I've gone on missionary trips, I'm not super open to preaching the gospel to the people next to me in the airplane or the airport. I have this mindset like, hey, the ministry starts when I get off the plane and I'm in the, the, the country I'm going to to minister to the people. This person next to me, they can hear about Jesus somewhere else. I got to go to sleep or whatever, right? And, and I get convicted sometimes because the Lord will open up conversations and we'll start talking. With, with, you know, it's pretty rare, but, but you'll have a conversation with someone. And you're like, man, God put me in this seat on this person for the, this, this very moment. Well, that's out of season for me. <laughs> Because I know that this is going to be a 12-hour flight, and I know what's headed for me, and I need to sleep, and I you know, have all these things. Or if I'm going to you know, the coffee shop or the grocery store, and I just want to get in and get out, and I don't really want to talk to anybody. I don't really want to socialize or be nice to people. I just kind of want to do my own thing. I'm an American. I don't really want to you know, interact with people. <laughs> you know? and, and someone says, hey, hey, what's going on? What are you doing? Well, I'm trying to enjoy my coffee you know, or whatever. Like, you know, you, you're out of season. You're at the coffee, uh, I, this happened to me one time, I was at a coffee shop studying for a Bible study, this is no joke, and again, this is a little bit confession time, uh, I was at a coffee shop studying for a Bible study, and someone asked me, hey, what are you doing? I was like, oh, just, just getting ready for something, like, totally brushed them off, like, totally just like, dude, don't bother me, I'm here, don't, I don't need conversation right now, I'm locked in, right, and, and I remember, you know, it, I'm a slow learner. It was like several hours after I had left the coffee shop. I thought, man, I wonder if that was an open door, uh, you know, but be ready in season, out of season. There are times where maybe it's not convenient. Maybe, it, maybe that, you know, obviously there's timing and God's opens up doors and, and, and I don't want to, you know, I want to be careful with this. I'm not saying, you know, push open every door, but there are times where the Lord will present opportunities for us where we just don't feel like preaching the gospel or sharing the word of God. And Paul says, man, preach the word because there's a time coming where people don't want to hear the truth. There's a time that's coming that people will run from the truth. They'll, uh, the only thing they'll want to hear is that's going to, the things that they want to hear is going to itch their ears. They're not going to be interested in the truth of the gospel. So when that, that opportunity arises, even if you are tired, you don't feel like it, man, preach the word. And it's such a great encouragement for us as Christians here to share God's word because it's really the thing, the only thing that we have that's, that's going to be lasting. I hope you understand that, 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 you know, we can, there's, there's tremendous, um, help, helpful resources out there, right? Um, there's, there's a book you'll read and you're like, man, this book changed my life. And, and there are, I've read books like that. I'm like, man, I read this. This is an awesome book. This is great, but it's not the word of God. There's things, there's programs that are helpful. You know, I don't want to diminish any of those things, but the encouragement, the exhortation that Paul's giving here to Timothy is to preach the gospel, preach the, teach the word of God, because that's what's going to be lasting. That is what's going to change someone's life. That's the power of God and the salvation. That's something that's going to change the culture. Books will come and go. There'll be phases, right? I mean, you know, all, all the different titles throughout the years. They've come and they've gone. But the word of God to come in and impact a culture, impact the society the, 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 where we live or Paul lived or any generation lived, that's what really matters. If I'm going to be effective in my world and the world I live in, the community that I live in, it's going to be from the word of God. And so my responsibility is to preach it. My, my, my responsibility is to teach the word of God because, because it's powerful. It's inspired by God. It's something that you can give to someone and they say, man, that's what I needed. You guys are coming here on Sunday morning. How many times have you come here and you've left and you think, man, that's exactly what I needed to hear. 
I needed to hear the word. I needed to hear that verse. Or I needed, um, I, I know there's, this happens to Rich a lot. And this happens to me a lot. Or someone will come to me and be like, hey, man, that really blessed me. And, uh, and then they'll begin to tell, you, tell, uh, tell us how the Bible study blessed them. And we'll be thinking to ourselves, we never said that. But praise the Lord, right? Because God speaks to people and he uses verses. And they'll be like, oh, I was reading this verse while you were teaching. And I, I wasn't really paying attention. I was reading this other verse. But, man, it really spoke to me. And you're just like, praise the Lord. Like, awesome. God's word is speaking to you. Like, we don't, that's not, we're not offended by that. We're excited that God's speaking to people because his word is powerful. And so... So if, if I'm going to be effective in, in, my, in the world I live in, in the ministry that God's called me to do, it's going to come by the Word of God. If I'm going to have any impact, and we've seen this. I mean, Rich is in a place right now that has been affected by the gospel, not because we figured out this great, awesome method to reach West Africa. I mean, I'm not sure. I mean, we haven't really talked about the school very much in the, in the last couple of years, and, and we haven't taken many trips there. Uh, I know uh, I've gone there. Uh, over the last five years, kind of by myself, where I've taken one or two guys from the church and just to kind of stay, stay connected. And, and we haven't done a whole lot of, um, you know, evangelism necessarily, but, but we still have the school there that we support every month, that, we're, that, that the Word of God is spreading all over West Africa, that we've had probably at this time probably 15 or so hundred uh, students come through, the, come through the school, and they're all over, Nigeria, Togo, uh, Ivory Coast, Burkina Faso. Uh, I think the last time I was there, there was two, two uh, students from Cameroon. Like, I mean, it's all over Africa, all over West Africa. And, and God's done a tremendous work, and there's been many churches started, and people are teaching the Word of God. You know what the method for the school is? Teaching the Bible. Push play. <laughs> These guys listen to Pastor Chuck, Genesis through Revelation every single day. And then they do inductive Bible study through the whole entire Bible. It takes about seven months. Every six days a week, several hours a day, they're committed to it. And they just, there's no commentary. The only resource they have is the study Bible that we give them. And, and in that time, they, they, they go out after they're done and they go teach the Bible. Many of them, some of them come and they don't know English. So they spend three months learning English. How? By studying the Bible. And then they spend seven months doing an inductive Bible study through Genesis, through Revelation, listening to Pastor Chuck, Genesis through Revelation, the entire Word of God, and they go out and they're equipped to teach. I mean, that to me is powerful. It's not that we've reached, you know, we've we figured out some dynamic way to reach West Africa and that, that you know, if we implement this plan, man, you, you know, if you buy this plan for $19.99, you can, you can reach any country in, 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 in Africa or in Europe or, you know, if you want to reach Brazil, you got, it's $10.99 or whatever, right? you know, there's not some method to the madness. And that's what Paul's saying, that it's simple. It's preach the word. It's tell people about Jesus. You don't need to be have have great excellence of speech. You have to convince, and and you can in verse uh, verse two here when he says convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching, you can translate those as convict, warn, or appeal to, to, to the gospel to someone to tell someone about the gospel, warn them, speak the truth, say, look, man, there's there that that you and I, man, we fall short of the glory of God, but but Jesus made a way for us to have access. To him that if you believe in him we could have for, our sins could be forgiven and we can come to know God man that's that's the message that's the great encouragement so then he says um, what we've been kind of referring to for the time will come where they won't endure sound doctrine but but because their own desires they'll have itching ears and they will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside the fables and then he says this this lasting kind of encouragement in our section or exhortation you could say but you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist. Now, this has always encouraged me because there have been times in my life, especially early on, where, you know, I didn't really feel like I had the gift of evangelism. I was going on all these missionary trips. I was, you know, preaching the gospel in all these different places and, and yet didn't really feel like I had that great gift of evangelism. And maybe because I was trying to compare it to Billy Graham or Greg Laurie or something, you know, and I'm like, okay, Dustin, just calm down. Like, you're, you know, you're not the stadium's not 10,000 people there's three people in front of you okay so you know but I remember reading this verse and thinking man doing the work of evangelism I can do that I'm not sure what that is like do I need a you know I have uh, I have this image in my head um, and if you guys know who Billy Sunday is but he was an evangelist back in the day and he's got this picture where he's got a chair and I'm not sure what he's doing but he's got like a chair and it's like he's fighting something and it's like this pose and I thought is that what I need to do like I, that's the work of evangelism get a chair and fight on the stage um 
But, you know, there's this, there's, this, there's this reality that you and I, maybe you think, man, I don't have this dynamic speech. I don't have this ability to, to get up and engage with the people and, and preach the gospel like a Greg Laurie or a Billy Graham or someone like that. But listen, you, each and every one of us can go and do the work of an evangelist. We can go into the, our neighbor's house or our, in our community or in our people that we're surrounded with, our family members who know us, who love us, and we can continually share Jesus with them. We can continually share the truth of, of God with them. And that's what we'll be, we'll be fulfilling our ministry if we do that. And so what has God called you to do? What has God given you the ability to do, the open doors that you have in front of you? Because maybe, like most of us in here, we won't ever have the stage of 10,000 people to preach the gospel. Many of us, it'll just be our neighbor that we've been sharing with for 29 years. <laughs> Or it'll be our, our, our family members that every single event that we're at, man, we try to share with them what God's done in our lives and how God can change someone's life and heart. And maybe we do that for a long time. But that's the ministry that God's called us to. That's, the, that's what we're fulfilling. And if we do that faithfully with teaching the word of God, preaching the word of God, then we're fulfilling it. We're doing what we're supposed to do. And so I want to encourage you guys this morning, if you're here and you're a Christian and God's open doors for you and certainly all of us if you're a Christian here you're, you live in a, in, a, in a definitely in a world that's growing worse and worse it seems every day I mean it's it's getting to a point where uh, I feel almost somewhat bad I, I was telling the high schoolers a couple weeks ago that uh, because there's so many events that happen and 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 again we were we you know the information load is just insane that uh, there were several major things, tragic things that happened last year that I totally forgot about because there were so many things that happened and, and I, was, I was reading this article and I was like, oh man, yeah, that happened. I was like, how do I forget that that many people were, were killed or that, that event happened? How do I forget that? You know, uh, when I was in high school, um, let's tell you how young I am. Uh, when I was in high school, Columbine and 9-11 both happened while my time, my time frame of high school. And those two events were... I mean, they were like, we shut, like, we spent the whole day learning about it. Like, that was shocking to us. That was something we had never really experienced before, especially in high school. It was something that it was unheard of in some degree, or it was, it was certainly an anomaly. It was like, it was, it was so rare that that happened. Now, I mean, that's a common event, not 9 11 necessarily, but certainly an event like Columbine. I mean, that's a, a, a common occurrence, it seems. And, and you look at that and you say, man, how can we reach people? <laughs> how can we bring the gospel to that community that's hurting? Or how can we share with our neighbor who maybe just lost a loved one? Or how can we, how can we impact a community that is, is, is looking for answers? Because we have the answer. And that's maybe um, the only thing that we can, <laughs> we can offer someone. Maybe we don't have the resources to, to you know, provide financially or, or to the time to go to some place. But man, we have the word of God. And so us as Christians, I want to just encourage you guys. Paul's encouraging, exhorting Timothy to preach the word, to share the word of God with people. And I want to encourage you to do that. Now, it doesn't have, again, remember Paul said, not an excellence of speech, not a word, man's wisdom or anything that, that is this excellence, but just the simplicity that's in the gospel. You know, remember the, the early church was the, the commentary on them from the world was that they were ignorant, unlearned men, but they had been with Jesus. I mean, I love that. I love the fact that these guys are fishermen. Paul was was educated. Uh, you know, you had um, so you had you had educated you had educated guys. You had fishermen. You had tax collectors. You had I mean a wide range of, of people influencing the entire world, impacted the world because of the word of God. And so. May you guys be encouraged to go and to share God's word with people in the day that you live. Now, if you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, you need to know something about the word of God that is powerful. You need to know something about that God loved you so much that he came in the world and that he died for your sins and that, and that by believing in him, you can go to heaven. That's a fact, not because I made it up, not because it's something that we, we just say to, that it's nice, but it's from the word of God. It's God who said it. God said for, Jesus himself said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. God's word says that if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you'll be saved. That's what God said, not me. That's not, that's not something that we say, oh man, how can we get some, some slogans to get people really um, you know, engaged in the church? 
like when Jesus said, you know, take up your cross and follow me. That's not really like a good marketing slogan. Like, hey, die to yourself so that you can have life. <laughs> like, the first, shall, the, the, the first shall be last, the last shall be first. If you had that, like, as your marketing program, is trying to get people in the doors or something, like, hey, the, last, uh, the first shall be last. You know, if you're first in line, we're actually going to put you all the way in the back. <laughs> you know, sorry, you, you got here early. Um, my wife and I went to this breakfast place on Saturday, and we got there like 15 minutes early before it opened, and we were still like 30, 50 person in line or something. I was like, man, I wish this biblical principle applied that the last shall be first, you know, like the owner just came out and said, hey, you guys in the back of the line, why don't you come up, we're going to seat you first, you know, but it didn't work that way. But, but, the, but you need to know that if you, if you don't know Jesus here this morning, you need to know him. You need to give your life to him, and not because, I'm, not because we tell you to, in fact, you, you shouldn't listen to us. You shouldn't listen to me, but you should listen to what God said because God loves you, and God loved you so much that he's not going to let you, let you out. You know, He's not going to let you get away with not knowing the truth because he knows that Jesus said, that, look, the truth will set you free, and you'll be free indeed. That the reality that if you accept Jesus, that, that there's a, the burden of your sin, the shame, the guilt, all the things that, that weigh someone down, man, Jesus will lift those burdens from you and take away that shame, those shame that you have because of sin. Now, your consequences of sin or the circumstances you're in, you may have to work through those things and get through those things, and God will certainly help you through that. But listen, the reality that you and I can stand before a holy and living God is because of Jesus. And that's a reality, that's a truth, that you and I are sinners who fall short of the glory of God, but we're only made righteous because of what Jesus did for us. We can only say that, man, I'm forgiven, or I'm a child of God, or I'm going to heaven because of what God has done. And if you don't know that, and if you haven't received that, then, then the, the, the reality of, of, um, of you not, not receiving Jesus, the reality is, is that you're separated from God. That you, that you don't have the promises of God because you're separated from God. So how do you get the promises of God? Give your life to Jesus. And all the promises that he's given you, the forgiveness of sins, the hope of heaven, the reality of, of that relationship is found in him because of what he's done. So I want to encourage you guys this morning that if you are here and you're a Christian, may, may you go and preach the word to the world we live in. May you share the love, the compassion of Christ, the hope of Jesus, the the forgiveness of sin, the mercy of God. And maybe there's even times where someone needs to hear the judgment of God, that the reality of that, man, if they don't give their life to Jesus, they're going to hell. That, man, your life is a mess because you're fighting against God. That the reality that if, if, you, know, if, you, had, if you would just surrender to God and stop fighting, then maybe your life wouldn't be so jacked up. Sometimes, I mean, some people, I needed to hear that. My youth pastor, when I got saved, said, you know, all kinds of things to me. He was like, you know, it doesn't matter what you've done. You've done this, 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 and this. You need to give your life to Jesus. And I was like, yeah, you're probably right, <laughs> you know. And so preach the word of God. And if you're here this morning, you've been fighting God or someone's been telling you about God, they've been faithful, they've been preaching the word to you, and you've said, nah, I don't, nah, that's foolishness. I need a sign. <laughs> give me a sign. That's foolishness. Listen, the, 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 the word of God is powerful. And Jesus, when he, when he, when he speaks to, to your heart and there's that conviction in your heart, you're sitting there and you're like, man, I'm fighting it. I don't want to give my life to Jesus. Listen, that's, that's the Holy Spirit speaking to you. Don't fight that. Don't resist that. Surrender to God and give your life to him so that you can, your, sins, your burdens can be lifted. Your, your sins can be forgiven. You can have the promise of heaven. So Danny's going to come up and lead us in a closing song. And during that song, I want to encourage you guys, if you need prayer for anything, um, I know we've talked about several things this morning, but if there's something that you need prayer for, maybe you just feel powerless. Maybe you feel like, you know, I don't have the ability to preach the gospel. I don't really have the ability to teach the Bible. Maybe be encouraged by Paul's encouragement that not many mighty, not many, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolishness foolish things of the world to confound the wise, that he's, he's, he's using the weak so that he can be made strong. And I'd encourage you guys to come up here. There'll be a couple guys up here that'll pray with you, uh, pray for you. And if you need to give your life to Jesus, don't leave this place without doing that. Don't, don't, don't walk out those doors saying, oh, 
I heard that a thousand times. Listen, I heard the gospel a thousand times before I got, became a, a Christian, too. But that day that I gave my life to Jesus, man, and no regrets because it was real for me. It was a decision I made that God was speaking to my heart, and he was, in, he was telling me, look, I've called you. I've, I've chosen you for the foundation of the world. I love you, I, and you need to come to me. And I went to my, my pastor, and I said, you know what? I need to give my life to Jesus. And he said, yeah, I think you're right. Uh, you know, he, he knew. But come up here. We would love to pray with you to receive Jesus, or maybe someone brought you, or just grab somebody. <laughs> just say, hey, man, I need to give my life to Jesus. I don't really know what all that means yet, but I need to do it. And, and don't leave here without receiving the forgiveness of sins and the power of God in your life. So as we sing, uh, may you give that to the Lord. And let's pray. Jesus, we thank you so much for this morning. Lord, we thank you for your word. And we thank you for um, the clarity that you bring, Lord, even, even if what I said didn't make any sense. And even in my mind, it probably doesn't make sense. But I thank you, Lord, that you make sense of these things and you speak to people in such a powerful way. And so, Lord, I pray that you would speak to each of us in only the way that you can. For some of us, we need strength and power to do these things that you're calling us to do. And some of us in here, room, in this room are need to surrender to you and to give our lives to you. And so I pray that they would, and they wouldn't, they'd leave this place being a new man or a new woman in Christ, that their sins would be taken away, their forgiveness of sins, and they would know that you love them with such great love and compassion. So... May you be glorified in this last song in Jesus' name. Amen.